Hey everybody, it's Ripley back again. Today we're going to talk about Lagrange multipliers. And Lagrange multipliers are a technique, or is a technique, however you say that, um, for finding, for optimizing functions given a specific constraint. So we dealt with this in the last section when we, when we started talking about optimizing functions in three space. We've also done it in two space back in Calc 1 when we did uh, optimization or max men madness. All right, so let me, let me, what we're going to end up with here is a method where some would argue it's easier to do the mathematics than going through that rigmarole back in 14.7, or excuse me, back in the last section where we had to find D and we had to take the partials and we had to take the second partials and then we had to check to see if they were saddle points, maxima or minimum, or minima. This is much simpler. Um, it's simpler on the calculus end of it, but it can be a little bit onerous um, algebraically speaking. But let's go into the into a little bit of the theory and it's really easy to show geometrically how this works. So what we have here is, I'm going to do this in two space because me trying to draw these things in three space is just going to be a mess. Um, what we have here is we have a constraint function which I'm just going to call g of x, y which is equal to k. And these by the way are level curves. All right, So we really do have a three-dimensional function but I'm just looking at it in two space just to give you sort of a, a geometric understanding of what's happening here. And then I've got my function f of x, y equals c and these are level curves for f of x, y equals c. All right, So excuse me, the function is f of x, y. We're taking the level curves at c equals 2, c equals 4, 6, 8, etc. All right, now, here's my constraint function, all right? So think of this like, remember we had, we did a problem, uh, we have a, a box of a fixed volume, right? Or we've got, remember the cost, we have a, uh, back when we did optimization in Calc 1, 2, we have a fixed uh, cost for, uh, I don't know, some god-awful manufacturing project or whatever. So this is our constraint, constraint, on the function. And this is our function. Now think about this for just a sec. Notice what the function is doing. It's going from 2 to 4 to 6 to 8. We're trying to optimize the value of the function given this constraint. So we would think that the, the candidates for that optimization would be wherever they intersected. So they intersect here, they intersect here, they intersect here, and here, and here. Now that's a special spot, and we'll talk about why that is. Clearly, this intersection is not a candidate for optimization. Why? Because both the function, and, or excuse me, only the function is continuing to increase. So there's no way that I'm going to have a maximum at for c equals 2. Likewise, not at c equals 4, not at c equals 6. Ah, now we've got something going on here, don't we? Because the constraint and the function appear to be parallel to each other. They appear to be tangent to one another, right? And then the constraint starts to peter off back down here. So meeting the constraint and the function, right, the, what the function tells us um, as far as output values, the maximum appears to be where they are tangent to one another. Now, let's talk about that for just a sec, because that's important. Why is this point of tangency important? Well, because at the point of tangency, do you agree that the norm, the vector is normal to both the constraint and the function itself, or just think of them as, as lines? If they're tangent, then their orthogonal lines are going to be tangent as well. Now, why is that important? Well, because it gives us a way to solve. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Why is that important? Well, because if their orthogonal lines are, are parallel, then their gradients are parallel as well. In other words, if I take the gradient of f of x, y, this is going to be equal to the gradient of g of x, y. But rate Ripley, my spidey sense is tingling. Why would those gradients be equal? Well, they're not necessarily going to be equal, but this vector and this vector will be equal by some, if I multiply through by some scalar, which I'll call lambda, right? Now, let me, let me make sure that you understand. I'm just going to take a minute. I know this drives you guys a little bit nuts. So right here at this point of intersection, hopefully you see that the gradient vector would point in that direction, excuse me, and the gradient vector to this curve would point in that direction, right? But right here, both the gradient vector to the curve 
and the gradient vector to the constraint are going to point in the same direction. Notice that I did not make them the same length because there's no guarantee that they're going to be the same length. Lambda may be 1, but there's no guarantee. So what we simply say is we can multiply the gradient of g by a scalar, we don't know what that scalar is yet, that will make it equal to the gradient vector of f. And what this gives us very cleverly is a simple way, <clears throat> excuse me, is a simple way to algebraically solve for critical points. All right. Now, this is the geometric reasoning or justification for what we're about to do uh, with our examples. Now, at the end of the day, what you need to understand is that when you're using Lagrange multipliers, all that you're going to do is take the gradient of the function itself and set it equal to the to lambda lambda being a scalar times the gradient of the constraint function. But there's an extra little twist. We got to remember that g of xy equals k, it, that's supposed to be a y, that's a little laggy today, I don't know what's going on, um, is always in play. And I'll show you what I mean by that here in just a second. All right, so this is the introduction. I'll meet you in the next little section and we'll do um, a, an example for you and you'll see how uh, lovely and elegant this can be. All right, see you in a second. All right, thanks for meeting me back. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to try and optimize f of xy, <clears throat> excuse me, equals x squared plus 2y squared, subject to the constraint that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. All right, now let's think about what this really, what's really going on here, because this can be a little, let, I think it's worth taking a minute to figure out what exactly we're talking about. So what I have is, and I'm probably going to butcher this, and as you guys well know, what does x squared plus 2y squared actually look like? Well, it's a paraboloid, right? And hopefully you can see that, because if I let x equals 0, then z equals 2y squared. And if I let y equals 0, then uh, z equals x squared. So I've got this guy going, whoops, I've got this guy going up here. Oh, yeah, I'm going to butcher this. This is going to be awful. So this guy goes up here. And then uh, let me change colors just just ever so slightly. I know that y squared goes up more quickly, right? Ugh. So it goes that way, like that. So it kind of looks like a parabola, but if I look down on it, right, if I let z equals 0, or if I let z equal 1, or z equals 2, or z equals 3, then I would have a series of ellipses. Now I need to, I should have erased that first. Sorry about that, everybody. Get rid of, right there. Okay. And I end up with, at the top, I end up with this paraboloid. Now let me make sure you understand, oh, that's supposed to, be better than that. I apologize. <laughs> the level curves for this, if I were to do level curves, then what they would look like is ellipses. They would look really badly drawn, elliptical and not circular, even though I'm subjecting myself to the constraint that x squared plus y squared equals 1. So x squared plus y squared equals 1, let's change to red, that'll be our constraint, lives down here and we know what it looks like. Now think of it not as a circle, but really as a cylinder. And what we're interested in is what, what will the intersection, the place where these two things run into each other, look like. So what they're going to look like I know that I may have confused you by saying for any fit, the level curves of f of x, y are ellipses. But when I take this cylinder and I run it up into the paraboloid, what I end up with is almost this weirdly sinusoidal thing that curves up and then comes back down around and then curves up, a, ugh, curves up again and then comes back down. I am such a lousy artist, <laughs> I apologize. But think about why this happens. Over here at x equals 1, when I go up to the curve, I'm going to hit the curve more quickly than over here at y equals 1, right? Because y, if I let x equal 0, then f of x equals 2y squared is going to be a steeper parabola. It's going to be higher at y equals 1. Right? So I end up with, oh my lord, let me see if I can draw this thing. I'm going to end up with a thing that looks like this, and then it wraps itself back down. Oh, so back down, and then comes back up, and then wraps itself back down. Oh, that's not bad. I, I know I suck as an artist, but 
here's where I screw this up. It's going to look kind of like that. That intersection is going to look like that when that cylinder slams into that function. All right, enough of my crappy art. Let's actually do, let's, let's go through the process of using Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so what does Lagrange, what do Lagrange multipliers tell me? They say take the gradient of f of xy and set it equal to lambda gradient of g of xy. All right, now let's see what happens. Hopefully, hopefully some magic. So th this is pretty simple, right? I know that the gradient of f of xy is going to equal what? Now, let's think for just a sec. It's going to be 2x plus 4y squared is equal to lambda times 2x plus 2y, right? Now, we know that I can take the separate components and set them equal to each other. So really what I get is 2x is equal to lambda 2x, and I can do 4y squared. Whoops, 4y squared. How about 4y? Sorry, kids. I know that 4y, 4y is equal to lambda 2y. Now, the thing to remember, and this is super key because I'm about to pop over to the other, other side, <clears throat> excuse me, is that I'm still subject to the constraint x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. So all three of these things are at play, all right, which is a bummer because, well, you know what, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to go over here. Now, you, you may say, well, Ripley, why was I able to bust this up? Well, remember, this right here is the partial with respect to x, right? The partial of f with respect to x. This guy right here, this 2x. This right here was the partial, whoops, the partial of g with respect to y. And if their gradients are equal, then their components of the gradient have to be equal as well. Right? So the partial of f has to be equal to lambda times the partial of, whoa, partial of y, Ripley, settle down. Sorry, guys, this is the partial of g. <clears throat> Excuse me, with respect to x. Not enough caffeine, or maybe too much. So I can set those guys individually equal to each other. Likewise, this is the partial of f with respect to y. This is the partial of g with respect to y. So I can simply say the partial of f with respect to x is equal to lambda times the partial of g with respect to x. The partial of f with respect to y is equal to lambda g with respect to y. That's basically what I did. All right, so let's, we're, we've got these guys right here. Let's see if we can figure this out. Now, it should be relatively obvious here that if 2x equals lambda 2x, then lambda has got to equal 1, right? Now, if lambda equals 1, doesn't this imply that 4y is equal to 2y? Wait, what? If what? If 4y equals 2y, then y equals 2y, which cannot happen unless what? Well, y's got to equal 0. Now, remember, though, we've got this lovely little constraint right here. So I know that lambda, if lambda is equal to 1, then y has got to be equal to 0, which implies that x is going to equal plus or minus 1. Right? So I have these two points. I have critical points right off the bat, and I don't have to deal with those discriminants. I don't have to deal with partials. I don't have to deal with, n. remember when we set the partials equal to each other, equal to zero, and that was an algebraic nightmare? Well, right now, free of charge, I just got critical points at one, zero, and negative one, zero. Sweet. Okay? Now, let's look at this guy. If, let's, if 4y, equals lambda 2y. Well, this implies, this has to imply, that lambda is equal to 2. But if lambda is equal to 2 by the initial uh, uh, gradient that we took, doesn't that imply that 2x is equal to 4x, which cannot happen unless x is equal to 0. So guess what? If I plug x equals 0 into the x squared plus y into the constraint, then I end up with free of charge. I guess it's not free. We put a little bit of work into it. 0, 1, and 0, negative 1. All right, now I, I'm going to kick over. I, I need a new, excuse me, I need a new uh, page. Sorry, my nose itches. 
I wish I had like a mute button that every time I did something stupid or said something silly, it would mute me and I could, whatever. Anyway, so what do we have? We have f of xy, let's do this guy, is equal to uh, x squared plus 2y squared, and we have uh, g of xy oops, is equal to x squared plus y squared, which is equal to 1. So this is our paraboloid, and this is subject to the constraint of the circle. And we had the points plus and minus 1, comma, 0. These are the critical points. And then we had a 0, comma, plus and minus 1. So these are my critical points. Now, this is the only place that I can have maximum, maxima, or minima. Now, I know back here, I, I gave you an example that dealt with maxima, but can you see that the argument would be exactly the same for minimum values of a function given a constraint, right? That, that minimum is going to happen in exactly the same place where the gradient vectors are parallel, and thus giving me the ability to say the gradient is equal to the lambda times the gradient of the constraint, which is pretty cool. All right, hold on. Let's kick back over here. I'm almost done, I promise. So now all I got to do is go f of 1, 0, f of negative 1, 0. My RAM, I think this, this uh, uh, my tablet's being a RAM hog right now. I got to deal with that. f of 0, 1, and f of 0, negative 1. And I have all this. Let's see. f of 1, 0 is going to be 1. That's easy. f of negative 1, 0 is going to be 1 f of 0, 1 is going to be 2. f of 0, negative 1 is going to be 2. Now, that tells me that these are my abs mins, and these are my abs maxes, given the constraint. Now, that's important, right? We the, the, Lagrange only works if we have a constraint. Now, let me go back to my really crappy drawing and explain why this is true. Look, my maxes are going to occur here, and here, when I subject the paraboloid to this circular constraint, my minima are going to occur there and there, right? Now, apparently, those points happen at 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, and 0, negative 1, 2. Now, please don't get cocky. Lagrange is lovely. It works really, really well. But there's also going to be some algebraic intensity involved with solving these problems. The lovely part about Lagrange is that the initial step is just stupid easy, right? Take the gradient of each one of them, take lambda times the gradient of the constraint, and then algebra eyes. Whatever pops out as far as your values, you simply plug those back into your function and determine maxes and mins. It's very simple. But I'm being a bit glib because the algebra can be a little... Uh, shall we say, awful. So prepare yourself for some intense algebra stuff, but uh, there are algebraic tricks that you're going to have to do to be able to solve these problems, but uh, I'm sure you'll do just fine. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope this was helpful, and I will see you in class. Have a great day.